before we announce speakers, I wanted to um, just remind everyone about 7 o'clock tonight. I don't know what's going to happen tonight. <laughs> I really don't. You're going to have every speaker speaking. So it's going to be like dynamite, I think, and they're going to bump off each other. So I'm not sure what's going to happen, but I'm very excited about it. Um, I'm in a, in a uh, state of decision-making right now, right here. <laughs> I don't know what to do. So we do have some gifts that we were going to give out today. But I think we're going to do that this evening. We're Is there a Cecilia Wiggins in the room? Is Cecily? Yes. Is she in the room? They're not back yet. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll do. I'll do her and Pastor Diane tonight. Is there any other pastors in the room? Okay. Thank you. I'm going to give you your gift now, just to do this. I just want to thank you for coming. Bless you and all you're doing for the Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. So we, we have a Pastor Diane from D.C., um, uh, and I want to give her a gift this evening. And Cecilia, Cecilia was the first, Cecily, sorry, Cecily was the first woman that registered. So I always acknowledge the first woman that registered, and then I want to acknowledge is there any lady in this room over over 75? Now get out of here. <laughs> Mama, put your hand up. Put your hand up. Put your hand up. <laughs> okay, is she the only one over 75 in the room? Okay. <laughs> okay, give Mama new wine. Okay, so as they're lining up these gifts up here, uh, do you want to talk about that? So the last two years, I made necklaces. And this year, my hand got allergic to the clay. I did not do much pottery this year. But guess what I do have? I have a print for each one of you. And um, we're lining them up. And so... Um, at the end of this session, you just come choose one and um, just let the Lord lead you to the one that speaks to you. And there's 152, and I think we are got everyone covered. Um, so be blessed. So as they're lining the, the, the gifts up, uh, we're going to ask at the end that you didn't mention that, that you just take one, and everyone please just take one, and also there'll be plants at the front door um, for each lady as well. Okay, that's, we were going to pass them out, but we're going to like skip over that part. So uh, this session is remembering his goodness. And as I look at every one of you, I can see his goodness. And it gets me so excited. And, and the way worship went was just amazing. So um, 
I'm, I'm in, a, in, a, in a catch right here because I have a lot of ladies that have a lot of topics. And if those ladies can all come and stand up here with me, please. We're, we're going to try to do halftime, okay? So you ever feel like you're in the anointing, you got to speak, and the pressure's on at the same time? And then you're 5,000 degrees, right? Okay, that's where I'm at. <laughs> so, so um, some of the women also... Miss Angie. <laughs> Jesus. Some of the women that are up here are also on Our Ladies uh, Board, Arise Women to Destiny, which is a women's group that's the first and third Thursday of every month. So I'm going to have them stand up here with me. I'm going to try to speak. I'm going to try to speak. But I want to acknowledge Renetta back there. Lift your hand, Mama. I'm always excited when she shows up. One day, I was in worship, and I'm worshiping, and the Lord said, go look out the front door. And I'm like, well, I'm in worship. He's like, go look out the front door. I look out the front door, and here comes Renetta down the sidewalk. And I just went crazy. But I heard Renetta. I heard it before I got to the door. It was awesome. It was that link, like that spiritual link. And um, I trained under her in intercession and deliverance. So uh, that's why she's so special to me. And, you know, she's famous in her daddy's eyes, just like every one of you. And, and the one thing that I love the most to be famous in his eyes is, you know, I think about and I honor, like, people on TV and all that, right? But I realize, like, the ones that are famous in daddy's eyes are the ones that are touching the one. They're mentoring. They're discipling. They're caring for. They're touching that one. And that one may touch millions. You never know. And he's always speaking and always reminding me about that. You know, just about being famous in his eyes. It just We are famous daughters to our daddy. We can be as spooled rotten as we want. And he loves every second of it. He loves, he just loves it. You know, she may not want to hear me complain about it, but I know the one that does. <laughs> so, so. When I'm pouting, anybody in here pout? Am I the only powder? Come on, I know I'm not the only powder in this room. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I've been around enough of you. We got enough estrogen in this room that we can conquer anything. <laughs> um, so I feel I like, when, when, like when, when they come, right, when my friends come, I feel like I'm just crying out to them all the time, like, ah, bah, 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 <laughs> you know? And they're just like praying for me and pouring into me, but it's good. <laughs> I need it. Okay, so remembering his goodness. Okay, I'm going to speak on things that um, I'm going to try to speak. Okay, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. Today, my son turns turn 30. So he's having a birthday party. So I'm going to rush out of here at the end as quick as I can to go visit him, at least give him a kiss on his forehead and get back here. Um, so <laughs> I don't know. But um, okay, so here we go. So Matthew 20, verse 13. Well, no, not verse 13 yet. Let me talk about Matthew 20 first. So as I was seeking the Lord, I was asking the Lord, God, what is it that steals us remembering your goodness? It is a huge topic. This is a never-ending topic. If you really want to, be, want to be real, you know. We get so caught up. Like God does something for me, he answers a prayer. And I'm on to the next thing. This is what's going on now. Baba, yeah, and this is what we need. And I'm seeing these people set free. And why isn't it happening? Totally forgetting last week of what he just did. The now moment is so important for us to take with us. So one of the other things that he was sharing with me is that, that when I use the word fair, if it fits you, you can think of envy too sometimes, if it fits you. But um, so the story of Matthew 20 talks about the, the farmer, he goes out and he hires these men, these men come in. And then he goes back out like 3 o'clock and he brings more men in. 
And he goes back out like 5 o'clock and he brings more men in. And they're all working, right? Well, the end of the day comes. And when the end of the day comes, they all go to get paid. But they're all getting paid the same amount. And guess how some of them felt? This is not fair. Why is this happening for, for this person when I was here all day? And why is that not happening for me? Why did I have to be here all day? The fairness that when we take our eyes off of him and we start comparing ourselves one to another, the fairness tries to come in and we think things are unfair. And then we start to forget about his goodness because that's all we can do is focus on the unfairness. It's a trap. It's a lie. It is a lie. Because I need to be happy when my sister gets a breakthrough, even if I need one too. She should, we should rejoice in hers and stop stopping the flow for us to have ours. Come on. He is good all the time. And there is enough of him to go around for you, me, and this world. Enough of him. More than enough of him. I'm telling you. There are some other things. Okay, so hold on. <laughs> I, just, I just went out of my notes. <laughs> hey, yes, Lord. Okay. See, and, and, and someone, uh, Tracy told me there's a host of angels around me all the time, right? And, and I've gotten that a lot. Why do you think all these ladies are up here? <laughs> Let me see where, whoa, okay. Oh, this is a really good point, y'all. <laughs> I almost forgot this point. So in verse 13, they say to the owner that um, we are not satisfied in your decision. Pretty, pretty much. Ugh, because they feel like it's unfair. So they feel like they're not satisfied in his decision. And he says, don't I have a right because I own it? Don't I have a right because I own it? How many times by us feeling that way, basically what we're saying to God is, I don't trust your decision. I don't trust your decision, Lord, because I don't think it's fair. I don't think it's fair that I'm working 60 hours a week and this person works 20 hours a week and makes more money than me. I don't think it's fair that they're married and I'm still single. I don't think it's fair that she's got the anointing like that and I've been praying for it for years. I don't think it's fair. Lord, your decision is not good enough for me. Lord, I just ask right now, Father God, for more Holy Spirit, Lord, and for us to have contentment, to remember your goodness, Father God, to remember everything that you do for us, Lord, not what you're doing for others, but we are special. We are famous to you, Lord, and you care for us in the same way you care for my sister and my brother, Lord. Shoo. Oh. So. I just break that lie. Yeah. It rains, it falls on the just and the unjust, Lord, but that doesn't make you not God. You are God. You are Lord, and you are Lord over us, Lord. We surrender. We surrendered last night going through the door, and my eyes are going to stay fixed and focused on the glory of God and what you do for me. You know, my husband said something the other day. I think it was Moses. Moses didn't start his ministry until he was 80 years old. 80 years old. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to tell you the truth. I might have an attitude if God made me wait till I was 80. I'm serious. That little Italian that you're looking at right here might be blowing a lid. So I am so thankful. And no offense to someone that's waiting until they're 80. Bless them. I just don't know how I would have felt. Like, I might have been arguing with God, you know. So um, I'm just going to be real because it happens. It happens. We get stuck. You know, and there's something I kept hearing is, you know, not secrets of the heavens. They're good secrets. But the Lord kept speaking to me about secrets. There is a couple of you in here, and I'm not going to ask you to stand. Because it is between you and the Lord that secrets are keeping you from remembering his goodness. They're taunting you.
but you can lay them down. You know, accountability is so important in our lives. Having someone that we're accountable to actually have more than one. Because sometimes the one might just get comfortable with you. You know what I mean? You might need to have like six or seven. And it's all right. It's all right. But let it out. Whatever it is, just know that you can trust them. You know, know that the Lord has given them to you as a gift and that you can trust them. Because secrets will devour us. They have an assignment from hell. And we need to lay them down and know that they are not important in daddy's sight. For some reason, they're only important because we don't let them go. But the Lord was really speaking to me about that. And tonight, there's going to be some pretty strong uh, prayer tonight, I believe, on some things. At least I know on my end a couple things that God has shared with me about that. Um, you know, I'm about out of, uh, out of order everywhere right now in my notes, so I don't even know if I can look at them right now. But give me one minute just to make sure I'm not forgetting anything. I'm going to pass the mic because, you know, it's hard. I don't know. It's hard to speak in the anointing. It's hard to have ten minutes. And it's hard to talk on his goodness because his goodness is never ending, you know. But I will say this, you know, for a long time in my life years ago, I remember the church we came up in. <laughs> Renetta remembers. <laughs> I so envied you. <laughs> I'm going to repent right now. <laughs> so, so, but, but I learned that is a good thing because it put a fire in me for more. You know, it can take you to an ugly place. We talked about it, I think, on Sunday or something it came up. But it can take you to an ugly place or you can keep your focus right with God on it. And it will take you to a place of more. It will make you desire more. God is jealous for every one of us. If, 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 so why is it wrong for that emotion to come up? It's not. It's what we do with it that takes his goodness away, you know. So, um, so uh, I, tried, you know, I, tried, you know, I tried to do uh, everything she did. She don't even really know that. Like when I go to her house, you know, it's so neat that she's here. I'm so happy. But um, I forgot what I was saying. <laughs> okay, hold on. Wait a minute. <laughs> oh, I know what it was. <laughs> so I just remembered this thought. <laughs> um. Don't trust him when he does that. <laughs> oh, get out of here. That's my good shoe. Stop. He stopped. Oh, shoot. Okay, I got to tell you the story about that. You stop it. Stop it. I am, honey. I am. Shoo. Anybody? Okay, I got to tell you a story about that real quick, and then I'll tell you. We went to this revival in Lakeland. Did anybody go to that revival? <laughs> Amen. Okay, so you know the revival I'm talking about. There was this guy, okay, and he ran around the conference with the shower head. And he'll, he would go, gush, gush. The Holy Spirit would just fall everywhere, in the parking lot, all over the place. Well, I, I don't know if you remember this. I don't know. I came back on that Sunday, and I knew Bishop was going to put us up there. I said, David, I'm bringing a shower head today because they all need gushed. They need it today. And, of course, uh, he wouldn't let me. <laughs> so, so, but we did pray for people. It was good. So, um, so but, 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 you know, you look at people's anointings. Every one of you are anointed because of his goodness. Every one of you. And it's so amazing, right? But sometimes we got to be careful. Like, sometimes we might admire someone's anointing, which is good. But sometimes we have to remember, like, I used to want people's anointings. I used to want them. And in a way, that is good to want it. And then I learned, man, did you know what they had to go through to birth that anointing? And I was like, oh, boy. No, 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 no. Got my own shoes. Did my own thing. I don't want your shoes. 
Well, you don't have shoes on, but I don't want your shoes. I don't want your shoes. So be thankful in his goodness of where he has you at, because right where you are is right where you're supposed to be. Don't believe anything less because it tries to come in and take the goodness from you. It is right where you're supposed to be. And the one prayer that we need to have more than anything, ladies, is don't take me where my character can't keep me. That's the most important thing because then in the end, guess what daddy's looking at? He's not looking at how many people got delivered. He's looking at you and your relationship with him. So uh, let's uh, wrap up. Oh, hold on a second. Wait a minute, wait a minute, one more. You know, I'm like a, um, um, you know, a real Church of God bishop closer. We got ten points to close with, okay? <laughs> I love it, I love it. I love it. I can... Oh, no, they got a good example. They're going to do better. They're going to do better. Okay, okay, hold on. Um, oh, I got something I want to say. <laughs> I got something I want to say. Shoo. Oh, yeah, yeah, let me do this one. Okay, so sometimes what takes the goodness is we get stuck in a trap of hurt, rejection, and pain from people feeling like, you know, when we feel like things are fair and not fair or like entitlements, um, we have got to come together and remember the goodness. Um, We must rejoice in each other's breakthroughs, which I said that already, and he is good all the time, and all the time he is good. Remembering his goodness makes us See, when we remember his goodness, it makes us always include him in our decisions. When you can't remember his goodness and you're caught, it's hard to remember to bring him into your decision making. We should be, we should be remembering his goodness every second of the day. Every second. How many in here, watch this. And if you can raise your hand, I want to know. How many in here can say God's never done nothing for you? Oh, good, because I thought I was going to have to break a hand. <laughs> you, you know, my mom used to tell me all the time, if you lie, your hand's going to stick up at the end. I said, no, it's not, because I'm not going to lie, Mom. Don't worry. But uh, So that's why I was saying that. It, it's a family joke. It might not have been a joke. I apologize if anyone ever tried to break your hand. <laughs> so, But all kidding aside, all of us, uh, all of us, none of us can say that. Okay, okay. so one more thing. We need to understand the deeper levels of God's intentions. We need to get down deeper in the roots of of our Bible and in the roots of our relationship. Because when we do that, we'll have a better understanding of why things are going on around us. You know, it took me, it took me years, and I still don't have it right, um, of three guys dying on me. It took me years of trying to ask God and understand why. Like, why did that have to happen, you know? Um, it's not an easy thing to go through. And, you know, by the time my son was, like, 10, we were at 13 funerals. And, and he went to, I made him go to every one. And a lot of people didn't think that was right because he was little, you know? I said, no, 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 he needs to go. He needs to understand, he, he needs to know that he's not saying goodbye. Otherwise, he never has that closure of what's going on. But it took me a long time, and it was about five years later, I got my first breath in that, of like, I felt like there was an answer from the Lord on it. And it was just a small little answer, but it was so huge, because it was like a breath of life came in. And it was huge, and his goodness just saturated us. So the other morning, some of you heard this, some of you may not, you know, as we were all in worship, mercy and goodness and grace and favor came into the room. And it was full identity of them. I'm used to seeing angels. But this case, it's, I wasn't seeing angels. I was seeing them in their full identity. And they've been here all weekend with us. All weekend, ladies. So the heavens are open. His goodness is dropping deeper and deeper. And I want to play this video. I'm not going to do all the scriptures at the end, Sarah, because um, 
I'm not going to do all the scriptures because I'm going to pass it on after this video. But I want to play this video, and then we're going to pass it on to the next speaker. So. Can you turn lights down, please, for a minute? tell you the scientific opponents or the structure of God. I'm not a scientist. I'm not even close. And in a world of evidence and logic, how do I, just a woman who knows little, explain to you of great knowledge, God? What evidence can I provide to the unbeliever who understands sight over feeling? You think I would be the one to explain because I was once standing in your place, hurting and afraid. I had gone down one of the darkest paths I could have descended on, yet I'm alive and have witnessed the miracles of God, so why then is it so hard to explain the existence of God? But how do you explain the wind when you cannot see it? Or the roots of a tree when they are so far in the ground? Or even the rain before it falls? Yet it falls, and we cannot stop it. Do you remember when you were a child? Where along the way did we lose ourselves to the fierce belief in the unbelievable, in the extraordinary? Where we had no doubts that the rain would descend from the clouds and wash the chalk from the sidewalks. No doubts that the sun would shine again. Do you remember sitting by the window, waiting on it to end, but knowing it would without a doubt? When did we stop waiting, believing, trusting? As a child, I had no doubt God existed. I didn't know what he was, but I knew he was there. <laughs> I even played with angels, but that is a distant memory clouded by hurt and life. After a long season, we always come to a place where we question what we once believed. And it was in my deep heartache, my deepest, deepest heartache, that I found my fierce belief again. It was in my storm I found a reason to reach out. And there, I was met by another who reached out to me. With holes in his wrists, I was confronted with a love I didn't understand but so desperately needed. What is God? Who is he? Where is my proof? And where is my reason? I don't have the answers. I just know that he is. It no longer matters what or why when the pain is taken. That's all I can tell you. When I am with God, I see like a child again. I believe not because I see, but just because I know it is that he is. This world has beat you down, has stolen your faith. I'm sorry you have been hurt. I know you now think with logic and to ever think with faith would make you vulnerable. I know you don't want to be hurt again and I know it's hard. But God is the rain. You don't need to see him to know he falls on your heart. God is the wind. You don't need to see him to know he walks beside you. God is the roots to a tree. You can't see him, but he carries you when you are weak, and he gives you life. John 20, 29, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because you hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. So you know what? I can't explain what God is, but I just know he's there. And he's waiting on you whenever you're ready. Okay, we can turn that off. Please turn the lights back up. I like what she said a lot. It really just uh, ministered to my heart. And 
We can no longer let what we see overtake what we know. And God's existence, God who is existence, is the one and only that will truly desires and longs for you more than anyone else ever will. So with that, I'm honored to call up Jessica Blumenfield, our next speaker. Jessica, there you are. Come on. Woof, 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 woof. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi. I'm Jess. <laughs> I want to share with you a piece of my story and how Jesus invaded my life and set me free. If I were to ask you and you have experienced a tangible, life-changing encounter with God, what would you say? Where were you? Were you here? <laughs> Many of us would say we were worshiping with our friends and our sisters here or wherever you've been in your church. There is a power and a presence that is released when we come together as saints and we lift up a high praise. Sometimes I've rarely encountered that feeling other places, that high, that intimacy, that glory. We've had amazing times here with electricity filling the air and holy laughter and shouting, and it's wonderful to experience his presence together as a family. But my question is, what do you do when you're alone and you need something from God? You need the whisper of his voice. You need the touch of his presence. You need the lifting of a burden. And nobody is around to lay hands on you. There's no shoulder to cry on, and there's no prayer line. What do you do when you're full of anger or rage or resentment, and no one is on the other end of that phone? Let's look at what David did. If you have your Bible, open to Psalm 116, verse 1, please. Psalm 116. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. Because the cords of death, they entangled me. The anguish of the grave came upon me. I was overcome by trouble and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the simple hearted or the childlike in faith. When I was in great need, that's when he saved me. Amen. I would like to submit to you today that the heavens will open over you when you are in great need. Like David, I have been in great need of a savior, of a healer, of a deliverer in my life. I would like to tell you that I grew up in church, but it wasn't so. I would like to tell you that I had loving and nurturing parents all my life, but that wasn't so. I would like to tell you that I was accepted, that I belong in my own family, but that was not so. And when we grow up in an environment of judgment and fear and criticism, the devil begins to put chains on you. And one by one, he puts those chains on you until you are no longer living, but you are surviving each day. Rage bubbles under the surface, and depression clouds your thinking. And life becomes something to be endured. See, I needed a savior. Okay, I shared with counselors. I went to recovery meetings, but still something was hidden so deep inside of me that nobody could touch it. Nobody could touch it but God. Okay. 
At 29 years old, I got saved, so I, I had a long time to work on my testimony. Okay? <laughs> long time. And I wanted to be cleansed of all that hatred and all that bitterness that was contaminating my soul. I worked the 12 steps, and I began chipping away at it. I worked so hard to change myself. Like swimming in the ocean against a great tide, it just became exhausting. I read book after book, and I just, I just had failure after failure. And something resigned in me that it would always be this way. See, I was in great need. One evening a year ago, I was spending the night at a hotel. Since I loved to sing and praise, I turned on the music and began to dance around the room. I was pouring out my worship on him who is so worthy. As the spirit filled the room, I was yelling and declaring in intercession, and I moved out of my natural self and into his presence. Then something quite unexpected happened. My words moved from intercession to a strong release of anger as I shouted at the Lord about what wasn't right and what wasn't fair about my childhood. I fell to the ground sobbing as a great dam, it just broke open inside of me. Everything I couldn't say and everything that I couldn't face, it all came spilling out as the Holy Spirit just surrounded me like a cloud. I felt his presence cover me and I was no longer in that room. The heavens had truly opened right over me. In the spirit, I saw a picture of myself when I was five years old that I had seen many times on my parents' wall. As I looked at that sweet, innocent face, the father just began to pour his love into my heart for that little girl that I was looking at. She was just so real and just right here in front of me. I reached out as if I could touch her, and I told her, that we had a father now who loved us, and that she was so wanted and she was so worthy of being loved. The things that she didn't know. I kept repeating it just over and over as God's goodness was just flooding my heart. This went on for quite some time. I, I don't know how long. As the tears rolled down my face, I was delivered from the guilt and the shame I had always felt. I finally knew that whatever had happened, it wasn't my fault. It wasn't my fault. And I knew that I was good inside. See, your heavenly father, he knows exactly what you need. See, he knows every single hurt that you're carrying, and he's waiting for you to come to you all real and raw. David called on the name of the Lord, and he was saved. Will you go to him today? See, only he can see into your soul. Only he knows what you need, and he only knows how to set you free. David said he loved the Lord, for he heard his voice, and he heard his cry for mercy, and he heard my cry for mercy that day, and he hears your cry for mercy too. Beloved, God wants you to know the words on the page as your own testimony, not as somebody else's experience, but as yours. Your father wants you to know him as your gracious father and your compassionate father, as your righteous one who takes care of you and is watching you. Don't live in bondage anymore, women of God. Call on his name. Call on his name. And watch the heavens open over you, wherever you are. If you're alone in your room, sometimes I'm alone in the car. He is there. He's always watching, and he's always been there watching over you. So, Father God, I thank you that the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon these women as it was upon Jesus. Because you have anointed them to preach the good news to the poor. You have sent all of them and are sending them now to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release of darkness for all the prisoners out there, 
to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Father, bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. For they are your oaks of righteousness. Thank you, Father. They display your glory and your splendor to everyone who is living in darkness, Father God, and everyone who does not know you. Lord, I pray that you would just bring them to the lost, Lord. I just pray, Father God, that you would shine your light out of their hearts and out of their eyes, Lord, that the people would be drawn to them. Lord, just like you drew me to yourself, Lord. Let them be walking epistles in the earth, Father God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. She might get a gift because she did exactly her time and a powerful message. <laughs> wow. Thank you, Lord. Her topic was open heavens. So that was her topic. Um, the next person is into the chambers. So my girl, my one and only. Deborah Meeks. <laughs> I'm ADD also. <laughs> so I might be all over the place. <laughs> Seriously, I might be all over the place. Okay, my name is Debbie Meeks. I'm on the women's ministry team. At Tracy asked us to speak, which caused me to be very dumbfounded because I was like, that's not part of the contract. But anyway, <laughs> I'm here. So, um, I want to share my testimony of being in the chamber. I can only come from what I've experienced. And so that's where I'll be coming from. So I was thinking about the chamber, and it made me think about the heart. Um, the natural heart, we have a natural heart, which I, you, I just learned this. Our heart beats faster than you guys. <laughs> I don't know why that is. Probably kids and all the pressure of raising them. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, no haters. I, I I just had to put that out there. Um, the natural heart has four chambers, and it has the left, right ventricle, and the atrium, left, right atrium. That's all I know. Um, but there's a pumping too, and there's a receiving, and that what I found that was very very interesting. So um, I'm going to go to 2 Samuel 7, 18, and I'm going to, you know, I'll be all over the place, but you get what I'm saying. 2 Samuel 7, 18 says, Then went King David in and sat. And he sat before God. He went into the ark. But we have, uh, not the ark, but he went into the, the temple before God and spent time with God. As always, at every point, important point in his life, David's first care is to take that which he has in his mind before the Lord. And that really spoke to me because how many times that I have some things on my mind, and sometimes I listen to other people. Instead of going in before God and discussing these things with him that's on my heart, because sometimes what you hear from people is oh, okay, but um, to hear the word from the Father is the best word you can get. Um, you don't question his word because you believe what his word says. Um, so um, I want to share an experience with you. It's a, it's, a, it's a bad experience, but then it turns out to be a good, ex uh, a good thing, an outcome. Um, uh, years ago, <clears throat> I had two miscarriages, and the first miscarriage just took me for the loop, and then the second one, threw me in a state of wilderness time because where I, and at that time, I couldn't go before God. I was just so consumed about this loss that 
I, I just, I, I couldn't, you know, and then I wouldn't, you know, and that's, and that's just where I was. I have to be real. I just, I, was, I couldn't. Um, I couldn't understand why this happened to me, you know, because I, you know, went to the hospital and they said your baby died and you're going to have to wait and, and um, go to the hospital. So they had to do what they had to do. And to live with that for two or three days with, a, you know, um, a dead baby in your body is another tra traumatic experience. That just threw me for a loop, and I just couldn't understand it. I couldn't, I just dealt, dwelt on that for so long. Why, 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 why? I mean, of all things, why? You let it happen, and then you, t you took it away, Lord. But I found that the more I stayed away from his presence, the more I was a wreck. I was a, I was a mess. I, I, I couldn't function, and I, I couldn't understand why I wasn't functioning. And I was like, I had to come to a point when I finally went into his presence, that it, it didn't matter. Um, I, maybe I don't understand because I read a book that God, what, you know, that God doesn't make sense. Sometimes it doesn't make sense what he does, but he's still God. He's still my father, and he knows what's best for me. I don't understand. We don't understand everything, and we'll maybe never understand it on this side of um, this world. We may not even understand in eternity, but does, it doesn't, I'm not saying it doesn't matter, but in the light of God, God knows what's best. God is my father. He'll take care of me. Tr things happen, and that's part of life. Trauma happens. So the chamber, the place where it's private. Now, I'm ADD. I don't like voices. Another reason why I don't come up here, I, I can't deal with voices because of my ADD. I got to hear me and God. That's, that's how I am. So it's a private place, and it's just you and God. It's very important that I'm finding with me is that I need to be before God. I need to get into that chamber because I, I work and you just hear and you hear things and you're part of the world's atmosphere. And, man, it's a lot. It can really throw you for a loop. So if I don't spend time with God, I'll get consumed and I'll just see myself falling or getting caught up. And I have to spend time before him. So I think that... I think of God's heart as many chambers. And in his chambers, I, I had this picture of love being over here and grace being over here and joy being over here. And in his room, is so many rooms that you can go into. Everything that you need is in that chamber. Everything that you need. You just have to walk in. This is what you love. You need love today. Like, God, I need some love today. I just feel, I don't feel like I'm loved. I don't feel... I'm going to walk in that I'm going to walk in that room of love. If I need peace, I'm going to walk in that room of peace. Um, if I'm angry, I'm like God, I'm mad. I he gives you exactly what you need in his presence, in his heart. I think of his chamber as being his heart. When the human heart doesn't um, doesn't beat properly, it it can't pump blood effectively. So if we don't stay in the presence of God, we can't function right. We're just, it, you, I mean, you just can't function. You're like, what is wrong with me? And God reminds me, did you spend time with me today? Did you spend time in my presence? And I go like, well, no, God, I, I, I didn't. And I, and I mean, I, I got to remember that I need to do that because you just, you just can't function. Somebody come up to you and say something and throw you for a loop and you get caught up in it when you haven't spent time. I mean, we're supposed to put on the whole armor of God daily. And we'd be clothed in righteousness and bathed in it. And if we're not, then the things that's um, a part of this world would get to us. Um, God's heart is always pumping out and something is always going on. Love comes in and out. Grace comes in and out. Mercy goes in and out and so on and so on. And I've Love for the fact that when I go into the chamber of God, that I get what I need in order to get out there in the world, even everywhere I go. Because it will take you down and not give you a second thought. The world doesn't care about us. It doesn't, it, it just cares about itself. So two things came to me when I was in the presence of God today. And that's another thing I'll say. This is my ADD coming out, so... You know how when you're a kid and, they, and you're, um, 
your parents tell you, time out. Well, we got whooped, but we didn't do no time out back then. But now or then, it's you have your time out. <laughs> we got whooped. But um, I feel like God tells me sometimes when I'm out of place, he tells me, time out. Time out. So I go, I do my time out so I can do my time in with God. And I like that when God tells me, hey, you need to get back in, you need to go back in there and spend some time with me because you got chip on your shoulder or, or whatever. And I was like, oh, oh, God, oh, I'm, I'm serious. He does that to me all the time. And I, I tell you, I get, because I'm, I'm not good all the time, I'm going to be honest. And I just have to, God, God just have to get me straight. And I, I love that about God. <laughs> okay, so this is my last note, if I can find it. Okay. Confirmation. I woke up this morning and last night. Was it last night? Confirmation and affirmation. So when I did my devotion this morning, it went said affirmation and confirmation. I was like, wow, this is really interesting. <laughs> so um, God encourages us daily to right living, encourages us because he loves us. And I love that. When you say he loves us, that's the story that really ministered to me because um, I – I just, I just felt that. I just felt that. And I'm going to take that to bed with me, and I'm going to get up in the morning. But um, God encourages us to right living. He encourages us because he loves us, and he knows that we can do all things through him. Um, he encourages us to keep on going. And he, in the same way, he affirms us in who we are and who we are to others. I had a chance to affirm someone uh, the other day because of, um, she needed it. And I, and I gave her the affirmation because God put it on my heart to do it. And I saw a change within her. This, this girl, we struggle so much in the flesh. And, 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 and I've been praying and praying and praying, God, how do I show myself to her? And God said, I want you to affirm her because all she hears is negativity, negativity, negativity. So I got a chance to um, affirm her. And then confirmation is God's authentication. That's what it is. So you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it is God. So God gives me dreams to encourage people. And what he does is that that confirmation with someone, if I have a dream about Tammy and God gives me some word for her, it's a, she doesn't, she may look at me and say, I didn't even know that was, I didn't even, you know, that was a confirmation for me. That, and God, that's how God works. So I just want to encourage you to stay. Stay before God and get in his chamber. Get before the chamber because there's a, there's, it's such a wonderful place to be. And it doesn't have to be something that you always have to go. When you go in, it's got to be a problem. It's just being in his presence. It's just soaking in him. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Mama. So ADD? No ADD. An authentic, dedicated disciple has just arrived. Yes. Amen. Amen. And you didn't get on rabbit trails. I got on more rabbit trails than you. <laughs> Come on. Thank you, Lord. Okay. Uh, let's see. Refreshed. Darnese Wiggermuth. <laughs> Come on. So some of these ladies that are up here. They've been at every women's conference, every one. And, and one or two uh, maybe missed one year or something because they were away or different things like that. But uh, that's why it was so in my heart. And some of these topics have been some of the women's conference topics throughout the years. And we're just dwelling on his goodness because God has just done so much in like five years. I mean, it, it, it feels like... <laughs> Love you, Tracy. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, okay, my name is Refreshed. And first I'll give you a Bible verse. Acts 3, 19 through 21. Repent, therefore, and turn away 
or turn again, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, that he may send the Christ appointed. And refresh means to restore strength. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of my testimony. Um, of course, I came from San Antonio, Texas. Oh, it's been 13 years now. And um, uh, how, many, how many of you know that God... God really um, uses everything to get to you. I mean, I mean. Um, so at one time, I used to like to go out dancing and drinking, partying, and everything, you know. And I mean, you you just can't find anything out there. I mean, you know, you're looking for a husband. You're just looking to be happy. It just doesn't make you happy. You just go home unhappy. Um, I had a friend that I was a hairdresser with. She came to know the Lord. She used to call me every Sunday morning. Are you going to come to church? Oh, I'm so tired. <laughs> I'm like, I'm sorry. You know, maybe next Sunday, you know. She'd call me every single Sunday. Well, on um, Saturday night, I got a phone call from another friend. And she was really distraught. And she said, Billy's gone. And I said, what do you mean? Y'all broke up again? What do you mean he's gone? She goes, you don't understand. He's dead. And I was just like, what? He was playing Russian roulette, and he blew his brains out. Um, that just made me get on my face before the Lord. The first time I ever really felt the Lord, I got on my face before the Lord, and I said, what are you trying to teach me? Why do I exist? Do you ever wonder why you exist? I mean, I said, why do I exist, Lord? Why am I here? And that morning, my other friend called me. She invited me to church again, and I was like, Lord, help me get ready. I got to get ready fast. I got to get to church, you know. So I went to church. It was a Baptist church. I sat in the back row, and I just listened. And I was like, how did that pastor know what I was going through? Was he reading my mail or something? Oh, my gosh. I was just blown away, you know. But um, so I didn't go every Sunday. I went a little bit here and there. Because, you know, the Holy Spirit works on you, you know. It takes some people a little longer than others, you know, some people right away. So um, I continue to go out, still tired, too tired to go to church Sunday morning. And then one time I went, and I sat in there, and um, I was in the front row at the time. I had moved up a little bit to the middle, and the Holy Spirit fell on me, and I was, like, weeping like a baby. And I was like, whoa, this is, like, you know, so awesome. And... And then my friend, um, she called me up and she said, how would you like to teach Iwanas? I'm like, Iwanas? I don't even know the Bible. So she said, she said, this is how I got to know the Bible was teaching the kids. I was like, okay. So I went on uh, Wednesday nights. And um, before that, I started uh, doing singles ministry, which was really, really awesome. You know, we had singles Bible studies, so I was starting to learn. So I did the kids, three- to five-year-olds. I'm telling you, those kids just, oh, they took my heart, you know. It was so awesome. It was just so awesome. I just loved it so much. And um, so then I was in church another time. I started going to church every Sunday by then. I was just so eager to get up and go to church when I felt the Holy Spirit. And when you really feel the Holy Spirit and you ask him to show you, you know, in the Bible, too, then you, you're able to read the Bible again. And so I was sitting in church, and the pastor, I can't even remember what it was he said, but it tugged at my heart, and I was like, okay, 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 I'll teach Sunday school. You know, so I started teaching Sunday school, and I was there for about five years before I met my, my husband. Of course, the Lord brought my husband to me, too, you know, and that was really awesome. But I have to tell you that um, don't give up on your friends. I love evangelism. We go out every Thursday night. I love evangelism. Do not give up on your friends. You could be that one, one phone call that could save a person's life. Just don't give up on your friends. And I just ask if, if there's anybody here, I'm sure everybody here knows Jesus. I know everybody here knows Jesus. But take it out to the streets. Take it out to your friends. Don't give up on your friends because, because I just wish I wish I had gotten to my friend and her. They had been living together for like 11 years before he did that. 
you know. And then I had another friend here in Maryland that her brother committed suicide. And every time I hear something like that, it makes me cry because I wish that I could have been there. I wish I could have planted the seed, you know. So don't stop. Just don't stop telling people about Jesus because, you know, it's just – <laughs> it's just got to be in the blood, you know. It's what we do. It's what we do. It's, it's, it's what we, this is what we're here for. This is why we exist. This is why we exist, to go out and tell the good news and to lead people to Christ. Thank you. Thank you, Mama. I will tell you that if you ever feel like you need to be refreshed, do exactly as she said. Go out there and start talking to people, communicating with people, lifting up the name of Jesus. He'll draw all men to him. You just lift up his name and you remember his goodness, and he's worthy of it all. And you go out there and you tell people how worthy he is. And guess what's going to happen? You're going to get filled up. You're going to get fired up. You're going to be refreshed, and people are going to be drawn to Christ. So amen to that. Yeah, yeah. Amen. <laughs> All right. Come to the throne room of grace. Colleen Ashley. Woo, woo, woo. Hello. My name is Colleen, and I am here to tell you how I came through the throne room of grace through the death of my son, John Curtis. And I might not get through this without tears, but I'm going to try. <laughs> um, my son was born December 22nd, 1980, and he died January 5th, 1981. Um, I was only 18 because I got married at 16. Um, I had an older daughter before John, um, and I'm still married to my husband for 39 years. <laughs> My son, John, um, took 22 hours to labor. I was very sickly with him all through the birth. And I was just so blessed. I really didn't know Jesus. I mean, I knew him, but I didn't know him as a relationship as I do now. Um, and so it was, he was born. I brought him home. And on the 10th day, I worked, woke him up to get nursed and his hands and his ears were all peeled down to the flesh. So we rushed him to the doctors, the doctor put him in the hospital to find out that he had a staph infection that caused herpes in his liver. And I remember um, laying there rocking because when the I, I don't didn't know much about the Holy Spirit, but I I come to this conclusion when I found out about Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit that I just couldn't stop rocking in the chair. And I just kept thinking about the scriptures about David laying on the floor prostrate when his son was dying. And I wanted to read them scriptures. And it's um, 2 Samuel 12. 15, and I'll, I don't know how far it goes down. So Nathan went to his house. Then the Lord struck the child that Uriah's widow bore to David so that he was very sick. David therefore inquired of God for the child, and David fasted and went lay all night on the ground. And the elders of his household stood beside him in order to raise up from the ground, but he was unwilling and would not eat food with them. Then it happened on the seventh day that the child died, and the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was still alive, we spoke to him, and he did not listen to our voice. How then can we tell him that the child is dead, since he might do himself harm? But when David saw that his servants were whispering together, David perceived that the child was dead. So David said to his servants, is the child dead? And they said, he is dead. And I remember 
when I was rocking, I, I don't know why, but that scripture, those scriptures kept coming to me because I was just starting to read the Bible, and I just kept hearing them scriptures about David and how he just mourned for his son to stay alive. And I just remember that ache in my heart of mourning, mourning for John. And, um, and I also remember how everybody was trying to bargain with God to let John live if they didn't do this or if they didn't do that. And, you know, God spoke to me and says that bargaining wasn't what was going to save John. And like I said, I didn't know Jesus like I know now. So I didn't know the power of the authority of um, laying hands on my son or um, how to pray for my son at that time. And I remember I went in and uh, was just st sitting there with him. And all the machines started going crazy. And they kept trying to push me out of the room, and I wanted to stay in the room, and they wouldn't let me. And I said to them, you're going to come out and tell me my son's dead. And I walked out. And I remember this really cute, she was just beautiful. She had these big blue eyes, and she's trying to hide them open so she doesn't cry to tell me that my son was dead. And I grabbed her, and I remember hugging her so, I mean, really hard. I just kept hugging her. And she said, I just didn't want to be the one that had to come out and tell you that your son was dead. But I also remember that I planned a funeral for this child. And on the funeral, all the family was very upset with me because I didn't cry. I didn't cry for my son because I knew where he was and where he'd be dancing with. So through that, I believe, God gave me such a peace about my son's death and that he was in heaven where he didn't have to suffer because he had a cerebral hemorrhage of the brain, for one. And for two, he would have had to have a liver transplant by the time he was two. So I do believe that God gives us all kinds of grace to get through the death of your child, whether it's miscarriages, whether it's stillborns, or whether it's you have them for however long. It's hard to lose a child. But I never, never lost my peace in losing him. Never. And when people, when I tell people about him and they say, oh, we're so sorry. And I tell them, he's dancing with Jesus. You know, and one day I will see him again. You know, I will see him again. So, so I, that's, that's how I realized that God brought me through the grace in his throne room. And my favorite thing is that I love to go to the throne room and dance before God. I love the chambers of God and to dance with him. And I know one day I'll be able to go up there and hold my son's hands and dance with him again. And I just want you all to know that no matter what, no matter what the hardship, no matter how hurtful your heart is, God can heal every wounded soul by staying in his presence and by reading his word and declaring what you want to see in your children's lives. And I just want to thank you, and I hope that God just is just holding your hearts right now for any loss. <laughs>
just was thinking about what she said. I mean, it would only be the throne room of grace that would carry us through anything like that. Okay. Looking in the mirror. Miss Angie Carter. <laughs> Come on. Hi, everybody. You're going to have to bear with me because after last night, I barely got a voice. <laughs> last night was crazy good. Oh, my Lord. So for those of you who don't know, I'm Angie. And hey. <laughs> and I'm going to talk about looking in the mirror. I did want to share something really briefly before I get into that, though. Last night, I shared the testimony and um, about uh, how God had me praying in the midst of a difficult situation with my daughter. Sorry, my voice will be in and out, just so you know. And um, I didn't share that after I worshiped God and I prayed for that family, the girl was transferred two days later. So I didn't want to share that. God is good. And when I was praying and seeking the Lord about looking in the mirror, I was just like, okay, God. Where are we going at with this? You know, I thought it was really interesting that Pastor Tracy asked me to speak about this topic because I am constantly checking my heart. When I tell you every time I'm in a situation with someone else or involving someone else, anything that's related to my feelings, I'm checking my heart. If I'm upset at someone, I'm like, well, why am I upset? I get why, you know, like that I'm upset at them, but why am I upset? I'm upset because sometimes when we go through situations with others and we feel this overwhelming feeling of grief or this overwhelming feeling of just anxiety or just anger or fear is usually coming from something deep inside of us that God wants to deal with. And sometimes it's hard for us to recognize that because we'll be so focused on the way it's making us feel that we tend to forget to ask the question, to God, why are we feeling this way in the first place? Because if Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly, there should be nothing that takes us away or separates us from the abundant life of God. So I was just like, okay. So I started beginning to think about looking in the mirror for myself. Like, what do I really see when I look in the mirror? What is the purpose of a mirror? What is it for? And the mirror, it reflects. And the funny thing is, when uh, I was looking at just the history of a mirror, I just wanted to know, where did the mirror come from? And the mirror was created 200 years ago. And it's really funny that when they created the mirror, it wasn't even clear. It was like foggy. And the only way... <laughs> The only way the mirror would work is if there was a light reflecting from it. It had to have a light reflecting from it in order for you to be able to look in the mirror. And I was like, Lord Jesus. <laughs> that was enough for me. I was like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> but it began to make me think when I look in the mirror and I see myself. Do I see the light reflecting through me? Or when I look in the mirror and I see myself, do I compare myself to the things God says about me or to the things I've been through or to the things I've experienced or to the things that held me back? And I was like, as I was asking that question, I remember an entire season where the enemy kept trying to remind me of what my past looked like. It was like I was driving in a car, but the only thing I could see in this time was the rear view mirror. There are side mirrors, there's a front window, there's side windows. But when I looked in the mirror, it was like, and I even had a vision of this, it was like my focus was on the rear view. <laughs> and I was just like, man, I said, Lord, I remember that season. And I remember when he brought me out of it. <laughs> and... I looked in the mirror one day, and I said, God, what do you see? What do you see when you look at me? And he says, I see my son. 
And I was wrecked. I was like, how could God ever compare me to someone that is a reflection of him? Well, the truth is, when we were created, we were created in the image and likeness of God. We were created in his image. I mean, we were created like him, but in his likeness to reflect him. And the truth of the matter is, although there was a mirror that was created 200 years ago, our mirror, as believers, as Christians, as children of God, our mirror was created 2,000 years ago, over 2,000 years ago. Because Christ himself, the hope of glory, the light of the world, came into this world not to just show us what we think we are, but to show us who we are. To give us an example, to be able to compare ourselves to who we're supposed to be. To change the way that we think about ourselves. To change the way that what people said about us, what people did to us, the things that they did to us, that's not the way that God sees us. God sees us through his son. And every time any one of you look in the mirror and you're not looking at yourselves as a reflection of God, you're looking at the wrong image. That's not what you should be focusing on. What you should see is someone who is fearfully and wonderfully made. Someone who was created in the image and likeness of God. Someone who God has called to this earth for a purpose and a plan. And you know what? With the pain that we've endured through life, with the things that God has brought us out of, not the things that even that we are growing through, everything that's in the past, we've already conquered. So why allow that to hinder us from moving forward? We shouldn't. We shouldn't. And the funny thing is, <laughs> the funny thing is, <laughs> with God, he doesn't see it that way anyway. So why should you? Why should you even waste the time? But in that pain, there's a birthing that takes place. It's a spiritual birthing. It's called pangs, P-A-N-G-S. It's a spiritual birthing that takes place from the pain. It becomes your greatest passion. I'm telling you, the things that you've been through in life, will cre it will just stir up a passion inside of you to want to go out into the world and conquer it and other people. And even like Jesus came to the earth for us to be the reflection of God to show us how we can conquer those things, how we cannot allow those things to hinder us from what he has called us to do in our life. And guess what? He didn't sin. He was without sin. He was without blemish. He was spotless. And if we were created in his image and his likeness, then we're spotless. We're without blemish. We are to walk in the spirit, not in what the flesh says. So again, if you're looking in the mirror and you don't see the reflection of God, then you need to question yourself about what you're looking at. You need to ask yourself, God, how do you see me? What do you say about me? And that's the only thing you should reflect. You will not be like the man that it talks about in James where he looks in the mirror and then as he walks away, he forgets what he looked like. Because guess what? There's a reminder of what we look like. There's a reminder of who we reflect. There's a reminder of the power that we have. There's a reminder of the authority that we have in his name is Jesus. And at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess, he is Lord. So don't accept anything else. Don't accept it. No matter what people say, it doesn't matter. If it's not the word of God, it don't apply to you anyway. It doesn't apply. And that saying says, if it don't apply, let it fly. Just let it fly over your shoulders. You don't even need it. But remember, you were created in the likeness of God. You have a purpose and plan on your earth, on this earth. And women, our emotions sometimes get tied up into our feelings. But the truth of the matter is you have to know the truth. You have to believe the truth. You don't always have to feel it. But it's by faith and not by sight. It's by faith. If you believe in faith that who God says you are, you are, you have already conquered everything, everything in your life that you need to conquer in order for you to be the fullness of who he says you are. But it starts there. You have to see yourself 
the way God sees you. And once you're able to see it, you can walk in it. You'll talk like him. You'll walk like him. You'll become him. And in doing that, you will fulfill your pl the plans and purpose of God for your life on this earth. But it starts with the way you see yourself. So I'll leave you with this question. What do I see when I look in the mirror? And I want you to, <clears throat> I don't have time to read this, but I want you guys to read Colossians 3, 12 to 17. Amen. Just trying to give her water. I really didn't want the mic back. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay. Okay, so we have another open heavens with Tammy. Roden, come on up here. <laughs> Move your eyes. Move your eyes. I've known Tammy, I don't know, what, 17 years? 16 years? share a little bit of my testimony. Um, I was always taught, don't tell what goes in here, say it's here. Okay. Rejection. My mother had me at 14 years old. They were raised Catholic. The Catholic teacher told her to have an abortion, but she didn't. So through all that, I was born at Mercy Hospital. Growing up, was nothing but fear. Always having a shotgun held at her head, the sound of the gravel in the driveway, knowing if my dad was having a bad day. But you were never allowed to tell what went behind closed doors. Getting away from the madness, I'd go stay at my aunt's and uncle's house. Where there, my uncle would force himself on me. Once again, I was told, you don't tell what goes on behind closed doors. That brought on shame. Longing for love, relationship after relationship, led into more abuse, shame. I ended up having three kids by three different men. I was made to have two abortions. Condemnation. Verbal, mental abuse, murder, you deserve this. You're ugly, you're a whore, you have no future, you don't deserve better, you're not a good mother, you didn't tell, you didn't keep your kids safe. Trust. What was there to trust? Trust no one. Betrayal. be real. Uh, I was married more than once. Um, I had a husband that had an affair with someone right in the church. Um, but I stood my post where God had called me. I did. I came in. I served the Lord wholeheartedly. And I went to this woman. And I hugged her. And I forgave her. I forgave him. Um, betrayal. Men, you know, you get caught up in pornography. As a woman, what does that make you feel like? You know, you don't want me. I'm not good enough. You're attached, you know what I'm saying, into this pornography and addiction. You know, when you're longing for love and you have somebody that's right there for you, but they're into other things. Um, my first husband, betrayal. I walked in, he was in bed with another man. Death. I'm lucky I stand here today and I have faced death. Uh, I was hit uh, by a tractor trailer head on. My son was six months old at the time and um, we're both here today.
Then Jesus came. Then Jesus came. <laughs> then Jesus came. He opened the door and he opened the heavens and he told. He told. He said there is no rejection, there is no fear, there is no shame, there is no condemnation. There is no death, but in the open heavens, and it's available for me and it's available for you. His unfailing love, his mercy and his grace, his protection, his wholeness. We are his beloved. I will not settle for less. I will not have a man mistreat me or abuse me. I know who I am in Christ, and I am not. I am not going through that again. And any woman out here that is going through that, and it's hard, but it's real, and it happens. But you have to find out who you are inside and who daddy says that you are and that you are worth it and that you are loved. You are worth it and you are loved. And without God, I would not be standing here today. I will not be. He is my everything. I've been a single mom. He has provided. He has been there for me in the lonely times when it was nothing but me and God, and I couldn't trust anybody. You know, my my worship for him and my, my love for him, for all that he's done for me, and just to love me because I have a past, you know, and I've hurt people. And I've done things myself. But the mercy and the grace and his love, there is no other. So when I got through this, you know, the heavens are open. And he just wants for all of us to have a healing. Our healing, our mercy, our grace, forgiveness. Sometimes when we get hurt and things happen in life, it's really hard to let go and forgive, to let go and forgive, you know. Um, I haven't seen my uncle for years and years and years, and I, and I seen him for the first time on a plane. And he wouldn't even acknowledge me. He wouldn't even look at me. But I went up to him, and I said, I don't know what you did to me, but I forgive you. Yes, you know. Um, so each, each, um, open heavens conference, I think God has dealt with me in different ways, but just the unconditional love and the forgiveness, and he has it for everybody in this room. God for his goodness, Whew. and his mercy, absolutely. I admire your anointing. But she, she does. <laughs> you know, Tammy and I were both born in Mercy Hospital. <laughs> Tammy and I are so much alike, like it is crazy. <laughs> Crazy good. Shoo. Okay. The next speaker. The topic is you are worthy of it all, Lord. You are worthy of it all. Everything, Father God. Yeah, 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 yeah. The one and only. Sheree. Woo, woo, woo. sing. Let's stand. Let's worship. Yeah. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For 
apart from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Come on, let's sing it one more time. You are worthy of it all. We're going to give you all the praise. You are worthy of it all. <laughs> For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. How many people can relate to some of the stuff you heard on this afternoon? Some of us are not yet at a place where we can be this bold, where we can stand before people. Like Angie said, you know, when you come out of something, those pains cause you to, something stirs up in you, it rises up, and you just want to go out there, you want to set people free in that area, you know? Everybody can sit down. <laughs> I mean, like, God is just so awesome. He's amazing. Um, I'm talking about the fact that he's worthy of it all. So I'm so blessed to be able to go last because everything that we talked about, guess what? God was glorified through it. It, it wasn't easy. It didn't feel good. You know, nobody wanted to endure, and it's never his, pain, it's never his plan for us to, to, to go through pain. You know, but he's always glorified through it. And he's worthy. He's so worthy of it all. So for me, I can relate to a lot of what I heard tonight. You know, and um, I could share a lot of my testimony, which I have. But what I would rather do is talk about our um, women's ministry, Arise Women of Destiny, where many people can have the opportunity to come in an intimate setting with a group of women who have a desire to see you rise beyond the things of your past. Like Angie said, no more looking in the rearview mirror, but being fulfilled with the fullness of your destiny, the fullness of your purpose, you know, and arriving to what God says you're called to. And that is what we want to do here at Arise Women of Destiny. I'm so excited to be a part of this committee. And there was a scripture that God placed on my heart, and I believe it's Romans 8.8. 8. These present sufferings, I think, no, let me go to King James because I like how it reads. <laughs> I put it in my quick memo so it could be quick. So um, Romans 8, 18, for I reckon, I like reckon because my grandparents used to say that. Um, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy. Nope. They are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be. That's a promise. It shall be, okay? It shall be revealed in us. So it's so much truth in just that little bit of promise. I mean, the Bible is full of promises of God. But just this one specific promise right here that's talking about, you know, the things that we are presently going through, the present sufferings, the things that we have been through, those things we keep looking at in the rearview mirror, they are not worthy. He is worthy of all because for from him are all things and to him are all things. He, he deserves the glory, right? So us knowing that the present sufferings are not worthy to be compared to the glory that is yet to be revealed, it gives us a hope. It changes our perspective. It causes us to, you know, not dwell, to not get caught up in the what if it could have been this way? What if it had happened that way? Where would I be if this, you know? We know that God is working all things together for our good because he loves us, right? So as long as we just continue to keep our gaze fixed on him, our hearts, like, uh, when she was singing that today, the end of worship, I, I caught the end of it because I had to go pick my son up from his trip today on Saturday. Um, but 
it was like I came in in my heart, like I, I heard it with my heart ears. You guys got ears on your hearts? I mean, because worship is a lifestyle. If you know me, you know. Like my son, I'm coming home from work and I'm super tired and I'm singing worship. And he's like, mommy, you're not tired. I'm like, yeah. He was like, and you still singing? <laughs> because the fact that I'm tired will not stop God from being glorified because that present suffering will not be compared to the glory that's going to come. Like when I come up here and I have the opportunity to corporately worship with my sisters in Christ and to go to another place in him, I'm not going to pass that up for some sleep. I know that God is about to release something and I want to be a part of it. You know what I mean? And I told mama, I told her just the other day, I said, you know what? I think this is why God keeps me. When, Because I always do this, and my son, he asked me this morning, why do I continue to torture myself? But God, like, I mean, our flesh is weak, and the spirit is willing. And when we deny our flesh, when we continue to say, I don't care how you feel, God is going to be glorified. He will meet you in that place every single time, and he will be glorified. And it will be beautiful. It's so beautiful. I love Jesus. So, um, yeah, the present sufferings, what you're going through, what you've been through, all of these things that consume us, that they take up so much space in our, in our day, in our mind. We're so occupied. We're so consumed by what's going on and what we want it to be and the direction that we're headed and we're trying to figure it out. But God has us all right in the palm of his hand, and he knows what he's doing. And we may not understand, but it's all for his glory. You know, it's all for his glory. So trust Papa and know that he is worthy of it all. (laughs) I'm done. I'm done. We can go, right? (laughs) See you back at, uh... (laughs) So... We are not done. All right. <laughs> so, um, okay, I, didn't, I, I guess we do need to be done we'll, because it is 518, and we come back at 7 o'clock. So hopefully you all, maybe you all need to fast. No dinner. For no, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, so, um, but, Lord, I just thank you, Father. <laughs> I hope, Father, that every message that was, you know, I just thank the ladies for being here. And I hope that every message that went out today, that it, it reached somebody, Lord. Your Holy Spirit just comes and it just ministers on it, Father God. You know, this person could have went through this, but the Holy Spirit could have ministered completely different to, to somebody because of it. And I just thank you for, for you're just so faithful to us. Um, Lord, I thank you that as we go, we will remember your goodness, that you're worthy of it all, Lord. And I thank you that there's an open heaven over every sister in this building, Father God, and that we just remember to reach up and just take what is already ours, take our portion, use our portion when we need it, use us mightily, Lord, more mightier than we can ever think of anything, Father God, because it's not about us, it is all about you. It is all about you. And when things try to come to take the goodness away from us, when we focus and we see things, Lord, that cause a disruption, Father, we just ask that we just take our sword out, like we said the other day, and we just start chopping it. We just chop it out of our way because your goodness will prevail, Father. And I just give you all glory and honor, Lord, right now over each one, Father God. That if you've not been a warrior, that if you've not been a warrior, Lord, no, Lord is a warrior, but if you have not been a warrior for the Lord, that I'm going to pray that warring spirit to rise up, to rise up and take authority over what you have authority over. 
And I just thank you, Lord, that you do give it to us. Amen. So tonight at 7 o'clock, tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. will be Rose Greer. Tomorrow afternoon at 2.30 is going to be Kim Abbott. She's the, the worship leader, Kim. So I'm just going to dismiss if, if anyone wants to come up here. Um, if you want to go to one of the speakers and get personal prayer, please feel led. If you feel led, please do so. Come, oh, yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Um, don't forget to take your gift. There's also a father's love letter, and there's also a plant. And I'll see everybody back. Pray that I can have the best quality time with my son in the shortest amount of time. In Jesus' name. <laughs>
scarecrow standing in the farms what is guiding has not been revealed you can't find something that's been found before and I won't find nothing if I close that door if I Everybody leaves the garden Everybody needs a guide Everybody's scared of dying No one wants to run